and I, now I would like the panel to uh, to come to the come to the front here. We, uh, it's not easy where to start, uh, but as we find your seats, Espen Egin Hansen from Aftenposten, Hildegun Soldal from uh, Alder Media, Halva Mo from the University of Bergen, and uh, Anders Offset from NRK. As you can see, we have a strong faith that uh, the future of media, or at least the analysis of the future of media, will be given to us by white males around 50 <laughs> years of age. <laughs> Only one exception. <laughs> um, hmm? <laughs> we'll, uh, well, dear panel, is this just old news? Did you know all of this from before? Anything surprising, anything uh, interesting that you have uh, read in this report or heard from Nick now, especially concerning Norway? Um, and what do you feel that you have learned from seeing Norway set in this context? Espen Egi? Is this on? <clears throat> well, uh, we know we are special in Norway. It's always been like that. Uh, the media use in Norway is higher than in uh, every other country. Uh, the reading of newspaper, uh, the willingness to, uh, to, to buy uh, a newspaper is, uh, has always been a world uh, record. We adopt new media uh, and um, phones, tablets faster than, than, than others. So. Um, so, to be honest, I'm not really surprised. And also, I think uh, the, the figures that you uh, presented today pretty much uh, supports what we see in the media houses, where we can, uh, most of these things, we can actually measure minute by minute. Mm -hmm. um. Uh, yes, we're always special, but actually we're pretty average, you were saying today, so I think that's that's sort of good that we are told that we're, you know, I think it's really good that Norway's now part of this, that's really great, and that we can see it over time will be really useful. Um, I think we like to see it as more special and that we're ahead of things, but at the same time I think it's healthy for us to see that um, things are happening elsewhere as well, or it's the same sort of trends. Um, but in terms of what has been able to really summing up, that's, that is sort of known to us. We, we follow our users very closely. Um, I'd like, I mean, maybe it's surprising that video isn't more of a, um, it's growing faster than it is. Uh, you hear an awful lot about it. Media houses are investing an awful lot in it all over the world. You hear about it everywhere. Um, so that could be sort of, uh, I think there's been, I mean certainly uh, in our land, we've had an awful lot of video projects and where we were sort of kicking it off, you know, back in, in, two, in the 2000s and then back in 2011 and then there's another one and another one and, you know, maybe this is the time when it's really uh, taking off. Uh, so I, I, I think we'll just see more, of, uh, it would be interesting to see this next year and next year. I think the, the sort of changes will happen in faster. Hmm. Pablo? Yeah, um, well, maybe it's a, it's a bad thing to say that you were surprised by any of these findings because I should have had it. Yeah. <laughs> I should have known. I should have known. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, let me first say that, uh, as Hilding also mentioned, that this is a really good thing that uh, uh, Norway is now included in these, in, in these reports because it's it's a kind of a rare kind of publication because it speaks to, I think, business as well as to the research community because it's so ambitious when it comes to the number of countries it covers and the issues it covers and because the World Institute really dare to tap into the newest developments and by doing that over time you really are building a, a unique database for, for business as well as researchers. Um, if I should pick one uh, small uh, 
bit that I was a bit surprised, or maybe it's it, you know it's an interesting little finding. It has to do with sharing of news. There's some uh, issues uh, or some questions about how much people like to actually share news and interact with news through comments and stuff like that. And uh, from the report, um, well, in the report you show that those numbers are not increasing. In some countries they're decreasing. So you know. And um, even though the use of mobile and all these and social media, etc., is increasing, the actual sharing of it by you know giving it on to your friends or commenting in in, in on a newspaper or what you have, what have you, uh, is not going up in the same way. And that's interesting, I think. It's really interesting. It's also the case that um, uh, Facebook are in trouble in many ways. So Facebook are noticing in their own data that people aren't sharing as much. In fact, one of the reasons they're focusing on professional content right now is to increase the time to support their advertising model because the sharing is going down. The other interesting thing about sharing is that we found that people who are sharing tend to share things that they like or approve of most. Again, this is slightly different in different countries or stuff they violently disagree with. So sharing is supporting uh, this sort of move to more emotional content. Uh, and indeed publishers are creating content that has much more emotional re resonance because it fits uh, the algorithm. I think this is potentially extremely worrying for, for, the, uh, for, for the news industry, for, for, for news impact, and um, there's been a lot of discussion about this in the UK around Brexit, for example, there's been a lot of discussion around this in the US as well, about whether the, the nature of news is not as factual or measured as it used to be, and I think part of this is driven by uh, by algorithms and by, uh, by sharing. Hmm. Anders, perhaps some perspectives on NRK and their interaction with social on? media? It's on, yes. Mm -hmm. NRK and the social media platforms? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I've been to uh, the Reuters Institute for a few years, so I'm not so surprised by funds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, uh, what I've spent a lot of time thinking about is uh, how we actually relate to social media in the media. Uh, because I think there are, I think we tend to be too frightened of them and we tend to sort of latch on to, okay, they're taking away this picture or doing this or doing that. But I think we also need to see that social media is a way to reach an audience that is much larger. I mean, if our main target we're doing news is to actually reach people with content and not to uh, earn more or earn less, but to have an informed society. I think we are too scared of social media. Hmm. One, uh, one general question for any of you. Uh, it is a fact, isn't it, that, uh, that uh, the um, um, established media are, are, are really dependent on, on the social media uh, platforms for, for in a high, higher and higher degree uh, for, for distributing uh, the contents and the news. And the social media platforms and search engines are, are really dependent on the media houses and producers for, um, for, for delivering the contents. But, but uh, still, in 2016, we, we get the impression from uh, from the public sphere that there is a sort of a fierce uh, enemy relationship between between uh, these two parts of the media ecology and of course it, it's a question of uh, revenues uh, how sh uh, who should get uh, what but uh, how do you think it will develop um, do the do the uh, global um, the global companies uh, understand that uh, they are independent, that they are dependent on the established media houses, or or could they start producing their own contents at at a given time? I think it, it's getting clearer and clearer that there is a, a need for in, independent platforms outside outside uh, Facebook and outside the dominant global uh, players today. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a matter of securing uh, the media houses to uh, stay independent. Uh, and uh, I am, uh, I'm, I'm worried of the direction uh, things are going uh, now. 
where a few key players are getting more and more uh, dominant. However, I think it's possible. I think it is possible to create uh, alternative uh, platforms, and I think it is uh, possible to create them tailor-made uh, for uh, independent media companies. Hmm. I, I, spent, I remember a decade ago, uh, Shipstead uh, started developing a, an alternative to Google, a search engine, CSM, and lost uh, 500 million kroner in a few years. Are you thinking of anything in this category? <laughs> well, we lost another 500 million kroner in ad revenue the last two years. So, uh, what seemed to be a lot of money at that point was maybe a, a, a nice try. Yes, we, uh, we are, as you know, uh, investing now real money in making a platform for journalism uh, and connecting that with a platform for advertising. And our goal is to uh, secure uh, independent media houses mm. and, uh, and uh, to uh, pull on and secure our more than 160 year uh, tradition of mm. bringing uh, journalism in this uh, country. Mm. Can you do this on your own, Shipstead, or, or do you want to partner with other Norwegian or international media companies? Uh, what we do at this point we, we want to, uh, to build and see if we can make it uh, work. We have already invited the rest of the business in Norway. I think uh, all and most companies are, are, are curious and, and looking. And, uh, and uh, I think we have, a, uh, if not a goal, uh, so a vision that uh, what, what we uh, do here uh, could, be, could, be, uh, could be scaled and used other, uh, in other markets as well. Mm. Nick, uh, any questions following up with the, the role of social media? Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear some other perspectives on this friends or enemies thing, and, and also um, I'm surprised to hear that you, you think there's an alternative to, to, to the big American players, because what we've seen over a number of years is there were independent social networks in most of the countries we were looking at, and they've gradually been taken over by the big players. With, you know, it's, it's the scale being rewarded. Uh, so it's going to be really hard. Maybe it's possible because you're a small market, I don't know, but um, do you think it's possible? And, and, and how do you view the likes of Facebook and, and Google as friends, enemies, both? Um, well, uh, they are here. <laughs> we have to deal with them and it's part of our uh, everyday. And we've chosen to uh, a stand where we, we want to test, we want to experiment, we want to learn. Uh, we're not sort of tied up to anyone, but we have to do it. We can't build our own platform on our own uh, in Allah. Um, and I think it's a really interesting question what you started off with, the dependency between, whether there's a dependency between uh, media and the journalism and these, are they reliant on us and is there a sort of a there is actually something for them. They, they, they have a particular interest in us because we have quality content. Um, and the moment we don't have that, or if we compromise on that, or then uh, we won't be relevant or will disappear. Um, there, there are lots of examples of that where people speculate in sort of uh, this sort of just, you know, uh, speculating with their algorithms and sort of writing content that's purely just because of what is trending right now, or quizzes, or lists, or etc. And there's no sort of uh, deeper quality to it. Or and I think now that we are talking more about, um, I think actually there is a as long as Facebook or Google are actually doing things better than us. Like when they make instant articles and they create a better user experience, they make better ads that are less annoying. Um, then uh, we should learn from that. I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't do it ourselves, but that's actually something that's really good for the user on the other side, So, uh, and we can actually gain more from it. And, and it's the same thing about advertising. Um, I think there's a huge... Uh, we can, some can take that role, like Shipster can take that role, but for uh, many media companies uh, and new startups, if you're thinking about sort of... Uh, new digital organizations who are going to try to do something new, um, they are going to have to play along with this and learn and really, really um, become experts in this sort of technology and they can't build it themselves. 
Hmm. I don't want to scare you, but uh, I have a question. I, I think it's a, it's a bit scary myself. Uh, we, we had uh, Jan Grønbeck, the local office manager of Google in Norway, visiting, visiting uh, our media commission a few weeks ago. And, and he denied that Google has any plans of producing editorial contents themselves. He didn't know about Facebook, of course. But if I were working for Facebook in Norway, I would uh, spend 100 million kroner hiring uh, uh, the 50, 60 best Norwegian journalists and, and uh, make, it, uh, make it the best editorial offices in, in, in this country. Is that uh, only a far-fetched um, fantasy? Could it happen? Uh, I would have done it. My, my sense is that uh, Google and Facebook they're interested in news because it brings people back, but they're not interested in news because it doesn't make any money, whereas, uh, you know, exclusive sports rights, or, so I think they are interested in content, and I think we're going to see that with exclusive sports rights, um, and uh, they're already buying up YouTubers and stuff like that to, to try and create content that brings people to the platform. Uh, I, I, think, I think news is really difficult for them in a number of different ways, and as we've seen with Facebook in the US getting very heavily criticised. Uh, but I don't know, what, what, what do you think about, I, I'm interested in, um, it, is things different here in Norway? Because in the, in the UK, uh, a huge proportion of the advertising is going to Facebook and Google, and that is building up into a, into a really big issue. But my understanding is slightly less here in, in Norway. I mean, it's, it's the same. I mean, it's, uh, Google and Facebook are certainly uh, taking a big share, but uh, we also have opportunities within that. Like, Allah has uh, working with using the Google um, the platform for publishers. To, to a programmatic platform, and we're getting huge um, revenue now through our programmatic platform uh, services. Uh, so it's, but we're just at the starting point. There's so much potential in it, and uh, um, but that's also something that we need to learn in the same way as I mean, whether it's the Shipster platform or if it's the Google platform or Facebook or someone else, that's still the, the it's completely new skill sets and ways of buying and selling and. And both for the advertisers and for us, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's changing very quickly and we need to learn it. Hmm. Well, Humble, um, uh, you, you're talking about you know, the relationship with the platforms like Facebook and Google. And, and uh, you know, if a relationship should, uh, will last, it will have to be healthy, we have to do compromises and we have to be a give and take from both partners, right? So I'm... Um, from, the, from my perspective, it looks like the relationship you're having now with uh, these actors aren't really that healthy or something that could last for that long. So it's really interesting, I think, to hear uh, Espen's, uh, um, what Espen says about the need for independent platforms here. Because I think, uh, if we take a, a step back, and, and this also is a comment to you on this, about the, the potential for reaching new audiences in social media, um, the reason why this, um, this discussion takes place at the Fritt U Foundation is because we're not just interested in these companies because they're businesses, right, that uh, employ people and stuff, but because they have a societal mission that they contribute to democracy, right? You can reach um, new people in, so in social media, obviously, but uh, also the divisions between users doesn't go away in social media, right? Uh, even though we move online, there are still divides between people and groups of uh, citizens in terms of how much they use the news, how much willingness there is to pay for news and which groups actually want to you know, pay for news online, for instance. So that's a perspective that I think is really uh, important to, to keep. And also, Nick, the, um, the question, does it matter if people access news through social media? Um, uh, that was a question you posed. And it obviously matters for the brand recognition, right? But on a, kind of, in a wider perspective, it matters perhaps more uh, when it comes to the independence of editorial content and the control you have and what you, what, and what you actually do as an editor and as a journalist. I think that's the really crucial issue. Uh, I agree uh, and I think social media has done a real good job on uh, being an arena for, for, uh, for a, a discussion about uh, all aspects of society. They're doing a good uh, job there, but they're not doing a good job as a kind of publisher uh, that are securing a democracy. Uh, what you want then is uh, many media companies, not one. You want uh, many editorial teams, 
uh, led by many editors and chiefs that you can make responsible. That, that's, it's, it's a very simple mechanism uh, that secures, uh, secures uh, a democracy. And so, in, in that sense, um, f Facebook hasn't done a good, good job. What they are really, really good at is distribution. Uh, so, a piece of content from often posting finds its, its way by itself uh, to some, some of the people uh, in, in this room. And the bearer of that content is data. Uh, so they know so much about us all, and they are able to use that uh, data in a really clever and good way. So uh, the right content finds uh, uh, its way uh, to the right readers. The problem is, of course, that some of the content doesn't find its way, or someone controls that with the, with the, with the, the algorithm. And so here's where I just think it's, it is important that there are many alternatives, I agree. Also, we work with uh, Facebook. Uh, they are actually fantastic. It's a, it's a great product. Uh, and I think we will conti continue to do that. But, um, but I will not put all the, all the future of Aften Boston in the hands of an uh, algorithm controlled uh, by someone I don't know uh, in the US. It won't happen. Oh, on that. First. Uh, I'm not saying that we should just go for Facebook and abolish everything else, because I think a pluralism in who makes content is really important, but I think we who work in the media tend to overestimate uh, the public's interest in news on themselves, because uh, I think people have been meeting news in their lives because they have come for a variety of reasons, uh, and maybe they're telling themselves, I'm doing this for news, but especially now where we have the VG model, uh, where you mix up uh, fun stuff and important stuff. Uh, I, I don't think people are crystal clear, I'm going to this place to do something important and then I'm going to do something else. Uh, and I think that model is weakened. Uh, when people are getting used to social media, because social media will, because of algorithms, uh, always have a better piece of content for you, because they are picking from it for all the pockets. Uh, and I think we should be careful in saying that to protect our previous model, uh, we don't want to go into a model where more people can meet news and important stuff. And that's my main point. I'm all for that algorithm, but I want to control it myself. <laughs> so the, in, I think what was the, interesting. The, yeah, the institution editor in chief has has to make the decisions on what that algorithm uh, should do. Not for everything, but but but, but uh, I want that control. I, I have a view that um, we we'll probably hit peak Facebook and, and peak discussion about distributed content, and I think things will will actually swing back over the next year. I may be completely wrong, but that's 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 my view. But uh, but I think the reason why they're successful is this point about ease and simplicity. And news companies have not done a good enough job in making their sites good enough. They've not worked cooperatively together to 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 produce the sort of simplicity, uh, the alerting, the convenience. That people, that's why they're using social media, and if mm. news companies did a better job of that, then they wouldn't be in this mess, I think. Can I just say one thing? I agree, uh, but just on the note of, uh, of news and social media, it's like this summer, which has been just um, a horrible news summer in a way, but very, which has been, the mobile traffic has gone up loads, but there's a... What we see is that we get far more direct traffic when there's breaking news. So there's still, certainly, and I think it's the same with Aftenpost course, and Luigi and all the main sort of news sources, that still, at least in Norway, there's a, when, when there's some serious stuff or some breaking news, really, you know, some bomb of some sort, then, then they go directly to, certainly in Norway still. That's interesting. What we found was that people, the first thing people do is go to social media, and then they go from there to 
the verified source that they like most. But the alerting is now done by social media, not by the, the news organisations, and that's what's changed. And the, diff the other difference is that previously they would go to social media and then they would turn the television on. Now they don't have to turn the television on because the video is sitting there, right there, in social media. So television is really suffering because of this. Did you ask about push, push notifications? And we're, doing, uh, we're doing uh, another project on push notifications we published mm -hmm. in October, which is uh, uh, really interesting. Mm. Uh, it's a good point, but I think we should be careful in thinking that breaking news is more important than we do because that's not what is shaping uh, our society. It's breaking news what will happen, and then it's gone. Uh, but it's, it's the everyday thing which I think is more important. And I, I think we need to get that to function properly and to reach the people that it doesn't reach today. Just picking up on that, can I ask a, a question about sort of trust in the news? So we haven't been doing this long enough to know whether the trust is, is going down, but obviously the perception in many countries is that trust is going down. And that um, part of it is because of breaking news and we've got too much focus on, on speed rather than necessarily explaining things. Uh, this has obviously been a huge theme in, in, in America in terms of uh, Trump, but also Brexit, that nobody explained what was really going to happen, and we were focusing on the sort of the instant news cycle. And I'm just interested in your perspectives about uh, about that, whether that's true in Norway, what we can do to uh, to do a better job in that regard. I think it, it, there are different expectations to different brands. If, if you see a, a tremendous successful brand like VG, I think we all have a very clear expectation that that uh, VGNet is updated. Uh, if you go to, to, to my site, Often Boston, we have been working a lot with uh, explanations, analysis uh, for, the, for the past uh, one and a half uh, year. And uh, the good news is that is what is fueling um, uh, sales, digital subscription sales, which are skyrocketing now. Uh, also reflected uh, in, in your num numbers, and I can just uh, con confirm confirm that. Uh, after I think 12 years of decline in the number of, of subscribers for Afghan Posten, we are now growing 5%. And and the drivers are not breaking news, uh, but uh, journalism explaining. I'll give you two examples for this uh, from this summer, uh, Turkey. Uh, the, the explainers going deep into what what, what is uh, what is going on, trying to reflect that. Uh, that was one of the best sellers uh, this summer. I have two two questions which are connected, uh, and it has something to do with innovation and and uh, making it easy for users, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, and but. Um, I, I, I never succeed in getting an answer from anyone in the media business when I ask um, are established Norwegian media houses more innovative or less innovative than, than, than the companies they can compare themselves with in other countries? More or less innovative? And the second question, uh, some of the very most exciting things in Norwegian media business today are, hap are happening in uh, startups, uh, small startups. What do you think? What type of businesses or concepts are likely to, to succeed and survive, survive when it comes to Norwegian media startups? So, innovation in the media houses and the future of startups. Can I answer that? Yes, then, yes. I think we used to be uh, years ahead of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, what you did in used to be, uh, yeah. What you did in in uh, in, in Love Brother, willingness to experiment, uh, VG and many other uh, media houses used to be. Uh, but it's a little bit like in the mobile business. The Finns used to be number one. Yeah. Then at some point the Americans wake up, <laughs> and uh, and when they do that, it's an incredible innovation culture. Both on the West Coast and, and, and the, uh, Boston, New York, and I think it's fair to say that uh, the most important things uh, going on, on on innovation within media is in, in uh, is, is going on now in the U.S. 
And I completely agree. I, I used to look to Norway, actually, uh, when I was working at the BBC, because I don't, there was just a fantastic innovative culture and lots of great ideas, uh, and Nordic countries generally. Um, but in terms of format innovation, you know, stuff like when we talk about video innovation, I mean, it's pretty much all happening in the US. Uh, companies like BuzzFeed have innovated with business models and innovated with formats, and there has been very little innovation in, in Europe, I would say, in the last few years. Mm. When, when I look at the panel now, I, I uh, perhaps understand that you are not the right person to, 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 um, to um, answer the question about startups. <laughs> uh, Anders wants to. Yeah, please. because uh, I've been looking a bit into that. Uh, and I think that the ones that have at least the potential for success are the ones that stand out, uh, that are not like everybody else, that are doing something special which they are noticed for. I, I don't think you could do a startup doing general news, but I think you could do good, well-functioning startups within a small genre, even in a small country like Norway, as long as you, obviously, as long as you have enough public in that mm. segment. Mm. The, the, the audience is, uh, is welcome to give even more sophisticated answers to which uh, sort of startups will survive. Uh, you go? Well, I just think it's. Um, I agree that the, sort of within sort, sort of more specialized areas, it's 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 probably there's there's endless opportunities to do it online, and it's far cheaper than ever before, and you can set it up very quickly and easily. And there are some examples uh, in Norway of that, but not enough. And I just, it's just such a shame we're only five million people in a way, <laughs> and there are only, you know, it's it's a sm like a small specialized area is sort of a very very small group. It's, it's very hard to scale, but um, so uh, I worry that there's not enough of the sort of media uh, startups. There are, there are lots of startups coming, but there should be more in media as well. And it's interesting in Europe, a lot of the startups are actually startups by traditional media companies, so they're spin-offs where they're trying to create new brands or do something, do something different, whereas in the States it's kind of much more tech-driven because of the VC culture, mm. etc. And so you're getting uh, much fresher ideas, I think, because even if you set up a startup within you know, Shipstead or something, then it's something of the culture is harder, mm. isn't it, or access to actual experience. Yeah. Espen, uh, isn't it true that uh, Shipstead in Sweden has its own division for startups, but not, not Shipstead in Norway? Sure. We, we have uh, here as well. Oh. However, there are fewer startups in uh, Norway, but it's it's really picking up now. Mm. So something is happening in in the in the, in the Norwegian uh, market. Mm. Uh, I must must say that uh, I, I think some of the things that are going uh, going on around uh, my older company uh, Shipstead is really interesting. We'll see now in a few months uh, what uh, happens, what has been done and classified. Uh, it's becoming one of the world's largest uh, companies in in uh, digital uh, classified. Now we are merging uh, again, re merging uh, the editorial business uh, with um, uh, with the classified and putting real money and real people into uh, technology. Uh, and reorganizing the whole uh, company, and so on, on the on the product side, uh, there are some really really interesting things are uh, happening. So I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, Scandinavia will uh, will hit, hit, hit back now, but uh, we'll see. We manage. And when it comes to newspapers, you'll end up with one one national ships the newspapers with uh, a few regional uh, regional variations. My vision will always be that Aspen Boston has monopoly. <laughs>